prepare for a depression. Not because I think that's coming, but because no one knows and they won't tell you in advance because they, being the economists, the bankers, all this, no one knows nothing. So let's look through history, shall we? We're going to read our 19, 1873, 18 September, Philadelphia Inquirer. We're going to type in the name J. Cook, and we're just going to go find, and we're going to see the whole Philadelphia Inquirer. We just got a little advertisement, foreign travel, J. Cook and Company. Exclusive on London, Paris, Berlin, blah, 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 J. Cook, McCullough and Company. Cable transfers upon Vienna Direct, passports furnished free of charge. Huh, interesting. No big deal. Just old J. Cook. You know, we're going to go one more. Oops, let's go to cancel. Let's go to search, and let's go to... 19 September, shall we? We're going to go to 19 September. We're going to say, what happened on 19 September for old Jay Cook there? And we're going to click on this guy. And we're going to click here. So the very next day, we have eight 25 matches of Jay Cook. Why? Financial calamity. Flutter among the brokers. Two temporary suspensions. Yesterday, the stock board had an avalanche of wild rumors. But solid ground under all. A panic not impending. Failures in New York and Washington, uh, scarcely more than, uh, let's see, scarcely, I can't read what that says, I'll kind of make it bigger, yeah. Scarcely more could the community have been astounded yesterday had snow fallen from the clear blue sky than by the announcement that the house of Jay Cook had been suspended. The degree of public confidence which that house enjoyed almost corresponded to that which is entertained by Englishmen of the Bank of England. Hence, when the announcement was made yesterday morning that the firm had been forced into a temporary suspension, the news was like a sudden th thundercap to thousands who believed such an occurrence simply impossible. Uh, let's see. A rumor on the street of failure, Jay Cook. Subsequently, another arrived pronouncing the rumor untrue, but a third came shortly afterward with a startling truth contained for the brief, Jay Cook has been suspended. To the public, says Jay Cook and Company, we regret to be obliged to announce that owing to an unexpected demands on us, our firm has been obliged to suspend payment. In a few days, we'll be able to present a statement to our creditors, until which time we must ask for their patient consideration. We believe our assets to be largely in excess of our liabilities. Uh, an acquirer representative who was redirected to the visit bank presidents, bankers, brokers, and others whose judgment on the circumstance was valuable felt them sharing the general feeling of belief that the suspension of Jay Cook will entail upon no one but themselves the loss of a single dollar. Hmm. As to his general results, the opinion was generally expressed that no widespread panic need of necessity ensue. Hmm. Interesting, shall we? Um, uh, here we go from, I think, a, uh, you can announce... Uh, that the firm has been tem temporarily suspended. Please state, I also believe that this house will speedily be relieved from embarrassment and that to this end, if need be, every dollar of the means possessed by members of the firm will be applied. No one who has a dollar on deposit here will lose it. Every liability will be faithfully discharged. I can say no more now. The above is all that Mr. Cook felt obliged to say. The London house remains unaffected by the troubles of the American house. All right, anyway, so you can see what's happening here. So let's just read what uh, I'm going to show you some. This is from the Chicago, the very, what is this, the very next day, September 19th. It startled Chicago, but it's not materially hurt her financial standing. Uh, Badger brothers, brothers suspend, but do not involve other bankers. The view of some of our leading financiers, uh, basically what they're saying, yeah, it's going to hurt for people back east, but no big deal. All right, so let's see what actually ultimately happened, shall we? Uh, so we're going to go here, um, and I want to show you something. Um, <laughs> hold on a second. How big of a deal this actually was, and we're going to show you what it turned out to be. Since the end of the Civil War, railroad construction had been booming. Between 1866 and 1873, 35,000 miles of new tracks were laid. Railroads were the nation's largest non-agricultural employer. Banks and other industries were putting their money in railroads. So when the banking firm of Jay Cook a company heavily invested in railroad construction. Jay Cook's firm had been the government's chief financer of the Union military during the Civil War. The firm then became a federal agent of the government financing of railroad construction. The railroad industry involved a huge amount of money and risk. The nation, let's see, marrying the, okay, uh, Cook's firm was a financial agent of basically building the railroads across the United States. And poured money to it. On September 18th, the firm realized that it overextended itself and declared bankruptcy. 
And then many other banking firms and industries did the same. This collapse was disastrous for the nation's economy. A startling 89 of the country's 364 railroads crashed. A total of 18,000 businesses failed in a mere two years. By 1876, unemployment had risen to a frightening 14%. An economic cloud settled over U.S. Grant, and he tried to find a solution that drove it away. So the interesting thing here is U.S. Grant, President Grant, our hero, to save the U.N. Union from Southern aggression. Oh, that's right. There was no Southern aggression. It was Northern aggression, but I'm a Yankee, but be it as it may, our hero. And I like Grant. I, look, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a fan of U.S. Grant. I'm a fan of uh, Benjamin <laughs> Chamberlain, Benjamin Chamberlain. Because may, that morning, Grant had eaten breakfast with Jay Cook. Isn't that interesting? All right. So anyway, the same year, the Depression, uh, Grant, he tried to find a solution. To drive away. Workers and business people argued that what should be done. Grant sided with the Eastern business leaders and adopted their ideas in easing the crisis. But when Grant left office, the cloud remained. That same year, the Depression set off railroad strikes. Workers all over the country, in response to wage cuts and poor working conditions, struck and prevented trains from moving. President Hayes was forced to send federal troops to more than half a dozen states to stop the strikes. And in the end, more than 100 people died and many injured, were injured. Southern blacks suffered greatly during the Depression. Uh, preoccupied by the harsh realities of falling farm prices, wage cuts, unemployment, and labor strikes, the North became less and less concerned with addressing racism in the South. They were never concerned with addressing racism in the South. They were only concerned about advancing Northern industrial. So check this out. Uh... Nearly all the railroad operations and construction were funded by debt. Anything that, prevent, that prevented Cook from selling more bonds and stock would cause the Northern Pacific to, uh, to coast to a halt. The credit mobile air scandal was just such a factor. The public perceived it as an indictment of widespread immortality within the railroad industry and the federal government. About six months after Congress concluded its credit mobile air, Investigation, Cook closed down his doors. This could hardly have been a bigger surprise to public confidence. As one Philadelphia Inquirer article, the one we just read, no one could have been more surprised than if snow had fallen during a summer moon. Without sales of Northern Pacific securities to Ponzi scheme, Cook and company soon ran out of cash. Uh, when hinterland banks tried to move their deposits with Cook in order to pay farmers for their harvest, they ran out of cash to pay them. The night before shutdown, Grant was a Cook house guest. The two had breakfast the morning of the debacle. Cook's failure triggered a panic and then a depression. Massive blocks of railroad securities were quickly put on the market, but there were no buyers. Prices declines of 50% were common among the leading rail stocks. Brokers called customers for more margin, but too many did not have a cash to meet the demand. Uh, the brokers failed. The New York Stock Exchange closed for 10 days, thereby amplifying the panic. Business failures in 1873 climbed to 5,000 from 4,000 uh, from 5,000 from 4,000 a year before, from 3,000 a year before that. Railroads had overbuilt. There was not enough traffic to support the capacity. Uh, and, but 1871, density had dropped to about 600 per mile, whereas before it was 1,000 residents per mile before the Civil War had broken out. By the end of 1876, the industry had defaulted on more than $800 million in debt. By comparison, the total federal debt that year was $2.2 billion. Railroad revenues had uh, dropped by a third. The railroads had defaulted on $800 billion of the entire federal debt, all for a civil war, is only $2.2 billion. Crazy, man. Track construction declined by a third in 1874, causing 500,000 layoffs within the ecosystem of railroads, including the iron and steel industry. Prices fell. Philadelphia pig iron dropped from 5, 56 a ton to 17 a ton five years later. When the poverty income line was a dollar a day, 10,000 Massachusetts textile workers and 60,000 Pennsylvania miners were under the threshold. The country seemed to be overrun with hobos and vagrants, all because of debt. All because of debt. No one call it. Check this out. I want to show you something here. I'm going to go back to... I love newspapers.com. It's like the best thing ever. All right, one second, let me find it. All right, as always occurs in such cases, there are hundreds who claim that they had seen the firm's troubles increasing month by month or for an indefinite time in the past and had predicted the blow that, that has come. These persons were able to see more than Mr. Cook himself, who has the name for being an unusually sharp, who has 
the name of being an unusually sharp-sighted gentleman, for he could scarcely assign a reason for the sudden uh, enamity of yesterday, even when the serious fact of his existence was forced upon him. Others insisted that a combination in New York, oops, let's see, can I get rid of this guy? Can I get rid of him? Uh, one sec, let's get rid of that. They long entertained the object of breaking up the honored firm of Cook and Company and at last accomplished their, por their purpose. Others ascribed the trouble to various other causes. A prominent Third Street broker informed one of our reporters that the suspension of the house, uh, which in turn caused the suspension of the Washington Philadelphia houses, was the result of the recent failure of Kenyon Cox and Company of New York, who went under in the pressure caused by troubles in the railroad stock market in that city. While well, I did not apprehend any serious result in the general financial commercial circles of the country, the informant of our reporter expressed the opinion that at least six to eight prominent brokers will be so affected, and it turned out to be a lot worse. So I want to go back to here. We're going to go back to my man, Jay, um, Jay uh, Dan Kulber stuff here, and we're going to look at the S&P 500. Uh, we're going to go back to 1872. So this is the you know, purportedly S&P 500, 1872. And we're going to look at inflation. And we're going to look at returns. Look at that. So 1873, 1874, not much. This S&P 500. But inflation was down. So remember, the idea that the stocks are hedged or against inflation, or de well, there's just no correlation there. So if stocks are down, there is deflation. Stocks are up, there is deflation. Stocks are up, deflation. Stocks are down, there's deflation. Look at that. Huge deflation. Huge. And yet stocks are somehow squeaked out, eh, not a gain, but over those five years. Yeah, I don't know about that. Then we had here in 1878, things started looking back. I'm not sure what happened. We can read about that. But anyway, check this out. Then we have another deflation, another depression. Anyway, no one calls these depressions, my friends. So you got to be prepared for it. And what always causes bankruptcies and depressions are debt over leverage every single time. Don't over leverage yourself. It's just that simple because no one calls for the depression. No one knows when it's going to. I mean, everyone calls for it, but no one knows when it's going to be. All right. Love your thoughts. Know your history. We'll see you.